Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Quigley. The man in the hill and the team, the drums card, no, you are the dog man, and what I got to go to you. But we can a human do them to get you. Kyo, more chumaga, Kagi Westa, Suge, or my mamma open, you are just dormant in Dr. Magi, Kagos to mock the big squeak. I say it's made rich to the sort of members and all the people from First Nations country. This morning, I thank the Creator for this opportunity, and I thank also the College of Law uh, for facilitating and uh, having the vision to bring together this form of professionals and interested personnel, including even some of their students to come here and see the real world operate in such a way that we could do these things together. So on behalf of the Chiefs of Saskatchewan, I am very privileged to try and represent our practical realities from the First Nations perspective as it relates to what they call Aboriginal policing. I just wanted to outline uh, the outset, I guess, the distinction between Aboriginal people. I represent the treaty status, uh, number treaty uh, people in the province of Saskatchewan. 75 First Nations, 74 are signatories of the uh, FSIN Convention, and there's approximately 115,000 registered status treaty people. I want to know, uh, just that the raise your hands, how many people here are treaty people? I was, I was hoping to see all of you raise your hands because you're all treaty. There's two parties to this treaty. You guys, the other people, and then us. <laughs> the crowns represented, of course, those people who considered themselves non-Aboriginal. So. We have a, a, a common goal here, a common mandate to bring about justice for everyone concerned, including your children, my children, our grandchildren. So I see this form as a clear opportunity, not only to dwell on the negatives, to dwell on the past and uh, lick our wounds, and, uh, but also uh, to outline, I guess, uh, based on our horrendous experiences uh, of the past, uh, to outline a path to the future. And I, I would also hope to see that those people in authority, including the, uh, the governments and the, the professors and the, the, the police officers, don't come here and pat themselves on the back and, and say what a wonderful job they're doing for the Indians. Because quite frankly, you're not doing a wonderful job. So uh, I just want to say uh, very uh, clearly that uh, we're here now today because of the courage of uh, the mothers, the parents that have lost loved ones. And uh, we don't have to, I guess, uh, uh, feel sorry anymore because these women and these parents and these families have come out of this and uh, still here standing with us and uh, cooperating with us to see that no other uh, family members are lost in, in, a, in a system that is oftentimes viewed to be very indifferent uh, to the First Nations realities. I want to thank the, uh, the panel members uh, for allowing me to speak here, and I don't know how much time i got, but you can give me the sign to, to, to shut up, because I do have a lot to say, and it's uh, representing uh, Indian people who have been victimized, oppressed by a system that is foreign to them. I think uh, it, 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 there's a lot to be said. And finally, with the report of Mr. Justice uh, David Wright, somebody with an authority finally heard us hollering and screaming and say, ouch, 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 we're hurting. Finally, somebody heard us. And from that rose men like Mr. Jim Madden, the former mayor of Saskatoon, finally he heard us and said, yes, the Indians are right. Chief Sabo also came to the media and said, finally. So we see this as an opportunity. The chiefs of Saskatchewan have given us no choice but to get in there and not let the flame die, because the flame is hot right now. The world is watching Saskatchewan. Not only Canada, but international uh, uh, authorities and agencies are watching Saskatchewan. And I think we're proud to say that yes, we have paid our price, paid with our lives. Now it's an, it's an opportunity for governments and uh, uh, other authorities to do something about this. Not to say there's nothing to fix like before, but to say there's something wrong here. Let's fix it together. And also to say let's give the Indians a chance to bring about the solutions that they see that are fitting. 
because we date way back before the treaties were signed, where there's a police presence. It's never been good. Before treaties, there was a good relationship. There was mutual respect between the first, the first uh, inhabitants of this country and the authorities that came after. And then after the uh, 1873, the Northwest Mounted Police were brought in to make, bring about law and order. And after that, one of the first tasks was to put the stop to all these guys that came and sold fire water to us, <laughs> trading for furs and pelts and that type of thing. And uh, the rest is history. It has never been good. I just want to read a bit of the history, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Uh, clearly, as treaty status people, we were promised everything under the sun. We were promised health, education, we call it a me. What in there is the four elements of health? The spiritual element, yes, we'll maintain that. The physical health, yes, we'll give you and then some. The emotional health, we'll help you with that. The mental health, we'll, yes, yes. All these things were looked at. And the spirit intent of that is that holistic health will be maintained and sustained by those people that came to sign treaties. In the area of justice, they promised us that the red coats will protect you. That means the police officers who were uh, given the authority to maintain law and order are supposed to be there to maintain peace between tribes and also between peace and the, uh, between the, the Indians and also the newcomers. Well, quite frankly, I'm sad to report that did not happen and it never has happened. <clears throat> Like was reported by the uh, professor, we have opened offices of police detachments on reserve and we have police officers sitting there waiting for something to happen. That is true. In many cases, we have had to phone Regina and two days later, an officer comes by. That is not what we call community policing. We are trying to define the role of police officers strategically practically and realistically. The Western concept of justice is punishment and only punishment. They call it corrections, but I have worked in the correctional institution, Federal Penitentiary in Saskatchewan, Prince Albert. All that is is a federal university for more crime. So that is not the solution. What we're trying to instill in the minds of police officers today is that you don't have to do this alone. And we should not expect police officers to be, to do this thing of policing, maintaining law and order by themselves. They need community support and we call that holistic integration. It's not sexual connotation, it's something that we call support from health, support from education, all the different ministries. I also want to relate to the police officers who are here that law enforcement should be at the bottom of your responsibilities. We hope that in the future we'll train up police officers to become referral agents, social agents, counselors maybe, people who are there at the front line of crisis situations are going to be able to access other agencies to, to report to. So as an example, I talked to the police officer here in Saskatoon and, and he told me out, out of the 30 days of the month, Almost every night we pick the same guy up for drunkenness and throw him in a cell. Well, quite frankly, I think that person is not a criminal, he's a sick person, he's a sick man. So what we need, more training, more facilities to, to assist people who are addicted.